editor of Playbill. You may have read her work in a recent Playbill and on Playbill.com or seen her as a co-host of Playbill's Facebook Live. Please welcome Ruth Firebird. Oh my God, are you freaking kidding me, Ruth? Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon already. Everyone having their best last day of Broadway Con? Woo! This is it, you guys. That to the most. All right, I want you to welcome to the stage members of the cast of Lincoln Center Theater's My Fair Lady. So then, then life comes back around. Yeah, and it was a really excellent lesson in um, 
letting go, you know, that and, and what's meant to be yours will be yours. And uh, and if it's not meant to be, it just won't. So it was. It was and she's was amazing. Oh, that's nice. And I don't think anyone can, you can't underestimate the the strain of this part in particular because she has the the Cockney accent and the other accent and the singing the high notes. And um, I'm in awe. It's amazing. No. And the other thing was uh, going back to the question about the rehearsal. Um, Bart was always very clear that because it's based on Bernard Shaw's play, Big Malian, which is about something extremely socially relevant, um, particularly, right, well, always, but I mean, women's rights and so on, and uh, Shaw was an ardent feminist long before his time. So Bart really wanted the play and the piece to be imbued with a real kind of truth, that the characters were really rooted in what their, their own particular needs were. And I remember he said, telling me in the, in, in early on in rehearsal, he said, look, this is a play with music, it's not a musical comedy. And that's, and that's a very interesting and serious thing. And it's a big distinction because it's not like, you know, tits and tea. <laughs> it's, well, it is tits <laughs> There's just tea. <laughs> <laughs> Tits and teeth. <laughs> like, you know, I did the share show, I did Pretty Woman. I would say this was the panel I least thought we would hear about tits and teeth, but here we are. <laughs> but you brought up a really important point, which is that Bart had Bart is very aware always um, of an audience's response and that they are that extra ingredient and that they're bringing what's happening in the, in the outside world with them to the theater every night. And he can, was- Can I just say one absolutely. thing? Had, the point that Harry made was, was, well, was really well taken. Having worked with Bart so many times, the best idea in the room wins. And that is a wonderful process at the end of the day. You come in with as much information as you can, no matter the project, you try and make it as honest and as real as possible every moment, but you're not always right. And the best idea in the room wins. And then the audience teaches you a lot as well. Um, it's, it's a really wonderful way of working. And, and it, because he had a bit of time to prepare, um, he knew everything. But he also brought in an Edwardian scholar who spoke to us about the flower girls and what they were going through when they lived without electricity. And, and, he decided to put in the shower scene from the Pygmalion movie to show that, more of that from mm. her point of view. Uh, it's, and it's, it's an incredible theatre and we were just given the resources to put everything into it and make it detailed. And Bart is a very rare animal in directors, in my experience, and my experience is pretty long, is that he's, uh, he really is not afraid to admit that he doesn't know. He comes in and he says, you know what, I don't know how we're going to do this scene. Let's try this, let's try that, you show me. And it, it was, it was, it's wonderful because it's not false modesty. It's a real, genuine, collaborative feel. But one of the things that he and I spoke about was that um, he really wanted to emphasize, you know, like you were saying, this moment in time, the, the gender rights, the, the class, disparities and how Shaw really believed in the equality of people and that it was circumstances that were different and that it was all about, yes, we're putting Eliza's journey front and center, but there are two plays happening here. You know, Henry Higgins goes through his journey and Eliza goes through her journey and are the two main plays. And then even Colonel Pickering and Doolittle, I mean, you go through such, incredible arcs here, but having been through the show, Harry, I'll start with you for, you know, now 10 months, are you still discovering things in Henry Higgins' journey? Does it get deeper for you? Um, uh, I think the overall arc is there. That's what we worked on and we played with different versions of um, and came to a sort of, this is, this is what we think is the best haven't tried, but, but you're right, within each moment, you're just reacting to what's given to you, what other people are throwing at you. 
and that changes on a nightly basis. Um, and you take in your characters' uh, sensibilities and sensitivities, and and work out. And you're, you're in the split second, you're working out how they would react in this situation. And that's what changes and keeps it fresh, and means I can continue to do it after two months without completely losing my mind. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Laura, you mentioned that she was a dream role of yours. What is it about Eliza that you were so drawn to in her? What, uh, other than those songs, yeah. what is it about her that she's just that part that you and so many others want to be? Well, a bit of it was nostalgia in that my mother used to play the record for me when I was little, before I was five. You know, I remember being around four years old. One of my first memories is her playing the record and then reading the insert to me. Um, and I just love Julie Andrews, you know. Um, well, so, who doesn't? Yeah, I mean, who doesn't love Julie Andrews? Monsters. Um, <laughs> people. Um, so, get out. If, get out. if there's anyone here who doesn't like Julie Andrews, I challenge you to a duel. Well. <laughs> um, so, so there was that, and then as I got older, um, I, you know, I love an arc. That's why I love Gypsy and um, mm. As a soprano in the musical theater, a lot of time you were stuck with parts where you're like, and then she swooned. So um, to have a person with true agency um, is 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 very uh, interesting and, and important to me. And to go from A to Z, you know, to truly have an art and then have to hit all the letters in between, it's it's a real challenge. And for me. Um, a challenge is, is fun. That's well, I'm with sure. dreams always comes expectation. Sure. What has surprised you most about playing her? Um, what has surprised me most? I'm not, I hate to be that person who's like, I'm not really surprised. I knew it would be hard, you know? I, I didn't come in thinking like, I got this. Like, I, I knew that it would be um, a challenge. I think probably the sustained energy, because it's an almost a three hour show. And so much of um, the, the, the challenging acting bits happens like at the very end. So to ju just to sustain one's energy all the way through, that has been the most challenging thing for me. Because, you know, Harry has young children too. So when you get up at six o'clock in the morning with the baby rooster and then <laughs> have to, you know, at 11 o'clock at night be like doing the hardest part of your show, it's mm -hmm. challenging. Danny, I want to talk to you because you have taken over just this past week for Alfred so wonderfully. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. I want to also say how wonderful Norbert was in the role. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. yeah. wonderful yeah. Norbert was to take over Well, we just, I mean, back to back, two nice. incredibly so strong. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> right? right? Yeah. They're so nice. nice. Everybody nice. loves each other. But, <laughs> what? My favorite part about watching you just the other night um, was the scene where you come to collect on Eliza. You come into Higgins' right. study and yep. you barge in. And I don't even remember what the line was, but I remember the picture of you. Like, no, wait! You know, the stamp and the hat in hand and the desperation on your face. And I'm just, talk to me about what that scene is like to play and what's going through your mind as Alfred, as you're trying to like make the con, but he's caught you first. <laughs> well, I had certain ideas of what the scene was about before I started playing the scene with Harry and Alan, and then they taught me how to play the scene correctly. <laughs> That's the truth. They, they, uh, when you're on stage with people like that, they make you better, a better actor. Um, they make you, they make you a better human being, you know, in that moment. They really do, they make you a, an artist. Uh, when, and you have to sort of come up to their level. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do in that moment. And I'm trying to convey many, many ideas at the same time. They're constantly, uh, I said it earlier in another interview once, they're constantly making uh, lefts when you, your body wants to go right. And that's what the character's thought process is like. So you, you're constantly trying to stay ahead of the idea. And um, that's been the greatest challenge. That scene, for me, is the hardest scene in the show because it is so, there are so many ideas going on at the same time. 
and uh, yet you want to, you want to, at the end of the argument, you want it to make perfect sense. Um, so it's it's a great challenge, and today is this afternoon will only be my eighth show, mm. so I'm still learning. He's, he's fantastic. Well, he's not a six-time Tony nominee for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank you have to respect the text, you have to allow the audience to be able to hear it, because that's where the humor comes from. They need to hear it, you trust it, and you've got to stay ahead of the audience. And he's, it's like he's been doing it for months, it's amazing. Wow. Alan, I was going to ask you, as Colonel Pickering to Harry's Henry Higgins, you guys have a wonderful dynamic that again, once Danny comes in, it, it just, it elevates as the triangulation of the three of you. What's What's something that Harry's bringing out in you in that scene, and what is Danny bringing out in you in that scene? Well, the thing about Pickering is, um, <clears throat> he was, he's, he's often played as a sort of bit of a buffoon, and he's not, and the, the, really, he's, he's, uh, he's, You're a he, he's, 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 yeah, really. <laughs> but from watching the movie, Colonel Pickering was always like that side character, that that guy who started the whole thing. But other than that, eh. and then yeah. seeing you in this show, he really is the third player in this. Well, he's sort of the guy who keeps Higgins honest in a way. He's got a, he, Higgins has no sensitivity in in an emotional sense to what he says to anybody. Really. He just goes, he drives through, he barges into things. And, and Pickering actually is the one who, he's kind of decent, and he keeps Higgins honest, and he looks after Eliza. I mean, and she even says, had it not been for Colonel Pickering, I never would have known how ladies and gentlemen behaved. Right. You know, ultimately, he teaches her. And so that involves not just kind of, uh, it, it, it involves a kind of strength, which, which you have to have, as well as being totally quirky, <laughs> bizarre, and kooky. But, but in terms of Doolittle, he's very, uh, he's very new still, Pickering, in the Higgins household. I mean, he's only been there a day. And this is a complete glorious one of, you know, those theatrical coincidences. They meet in the marketplace and suddenly he says, oh, come and live with me. Well, okay. <laughs> and then suddenly Eliza's father turns up the next day. So in that scene, actually, Pickering is much more a receiver than, than, uh, than, than, than someone who contributes very much. He has to listen, he takes it all in, and he comes back, he's always like this sort of, you know, this, this is what you mustn't do. Now come along, now come along. But he's very, he's slightly thrown by this bizarre intrusion, I think. And it's, it's a wonderful piece of writing by, by Shaw, and by, um, by Lerner of Lerner as well. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a great scene, which changes tack many, many times during the scene. You're not quite sure who's running it. Mm. Doolittle thinks he is running it, but he's actually not. Right. Well, that brings me to... In a way. Yeah. The fact that the scene takes place in Higgins's study, right? You walk into this majestic place, which, I mean, designed by Michael Jurgen, it's unbelievable. And it's... And it's supposed to be intimidating, but one of the things that blows my mind about his design and design in general is that it's not just there to impress you, though it does. It is there because it builds that story, that it creates the aura of who Higgins is. And I'm wondering what cues did you all take from that set, you know, you as this being your home, you being the, the guest, how does that, the majesty of it, cue well, you? Again, it was a very collaborative, the design of that um, was, was, was very collaborative. He, he was take and Bart, the three of us, were coming up with <laughs> my space. This has to be my space. He's someone who's um, ahead of his time. We've got, you know, modern art on the walls for the time. We've got different inventions. We imagined him as someone who had the latest scientific journal. Um, I remember you were talking about it. All added. Happened. There was just a bare backbones, and we went, "We want that there, and I want to, I want to pull it." 
because he likes pulleys. <laughs> and the next day we had a pulley for putting books up and down. And um, right, which I had said it seemed to me like, oh, because of course he has, you know, some some privilege that he wouldn't want to carry his own books. And you said, no, he's a man of science. Yeah, sure. So that it's the invention and it's, of and it. And it's fun. And it's like, how can we help? How can we add to our lives through technology? Um, and that, and we were gonna, gonna have little organs in bottles, but they go off after a certain amount of time. So, so we've got weird shaped things everywhere. And as a result, it's, it, it, it helps my character. It helps uh, build this image of this person. So I don't have to think about it too much. It's just there's stuff that is layered on top that um, comes from a completely different place. I heard some of those, the phonographs and things like that are, are real? Like yeah, all the, all the cylinders are real wax cylinders um, that, that sometimes go off, which is, which is annoying <laughs> because you've got the proper sound cues coming on through the speakers and you've got the something else happening down here. Actually right next to you. Actually playing. <laughs> what, did, what did you about call it? The man cave of the patriarchy. <laughs> that's it, that's exactly it. Is there another set or, you know, Catherine Zuber's costumes are unbelievable. Woo! Those completely inform who you are, you know, what you put outside affects what's inside. Is there a moment that you feel most informed by the costume and it has changed the way you think about that moment? Yes. If it was <laughs> pause it. I, I, so I go from the tailcoat into the long overcoat that's bagging around and that's a very, it's quite obvious and simple um, device to take you from control to zero control. Well, and, and the control amount of the detail, detail also in, in the set and, and the costumes and everything else, it makes it extremely easy to feel real, that, that you're really centered in your character. Because everything around you, I mean, that staircase is incredible. I mean, it's, it's a real room. It's a real room with, you know, incredible weight and depth to it. And, I fell asleep once in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I did wake up in time to save my life, but only just. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really, really comfortable. But it, mean, it means you're not faking. <laughs> you, are, you can invest in the character exactly. and um, it's just easy. And it's all real and it, it feels real. And on it, there have been shows when I've been, there's been horrible, like other stuff going on in my life and I've just gone in it and it's been a release. I've been someone else for three hours because it's, I feel like I'm in a different world. Laura, you have to practically jog around that set during the most strenuous song. That's not the most strenuous song. Okay, yes, well jogging. the most famous song. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is it like to sing while going through the doors and concentrating on the lines and having it spin beneath your feet? It's and, fun. Yeah. It's really fun. It was fun from the first time, you know. Honestly, at the end of the day, it's, it's not rocket science, you know. It's, uh, for me, I feel like ultimately I want to be having a good time. Because I do think that once everything these gentlemen has said is happening, the truth and, and, and everything they've been talking about, <coughs> there also has to be joy. And I am really, really having a good time. And I think that the audience can feel that too, so it's really fun. I was just gonna say, speaking of joy, the moment the orchestra starts playing the notes of that song, you feel that sigh in the And house. you hear singing from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and now my press, like an, an older man is like, all I want is a room somewhere. <laughs> running around so much backstage with wigs and costume. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, she's in a trauma unit. Yes. I, there's one point in the whole show I've worked out that I can get to see her when we're not on stage. Yes. And so I do, I come and say we do a little That's high five right. because it, literally she's running from, I could have danced all night yeah. to get ready for asking. And he's like, good job. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to put on another coat. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true, though. I will say, um, the, I you know I've never seen the movie, 
because I was, as a small child, so furious that Julie Andrews was not attacked to play that role. And I was boycotting the film. And then when I found out that she had won for Mary Poppins the year that, that yeah, I was like, yeah, I know if I saw her ever. Um, I was a very popular kid. Um, but, you know, I will say that the thing that everybody says when they come to see the show, who, who has seen the show before, is so often, Higgins is this sort of blustering, old monster person. And Harry... Is that funny? <laughs> um, but, the, but Harry's portrayal is so not that. You know, he's so human, and he's, um, he's playing a genuine person. And it makes it so much more complicated also for everyone else on stage in the best possible way. Because it's not just like, well, this is an abusive guy who I don't like, and, and he's mean and she's nice. It's not that. No, there's so much humanity. There's so it's much humanity to what he's doing. And it's really, it's, it's, it's a real challenge. And yes, of course, vocal gymnastics and running around on a stage is very impressive to watch. But at the same time, it's not any more difficult than what he's doing. No, I think that that's, you know, what we were saying before about there being two journeys here. 100%. And really both of them coming through Inequality, which is really the whole point of it all. It should and be called My Fair Lady and Her Bro. <laughs> That's what it should be called. No, no, he, he, well, he's the My he and My Fair title. Lady, right? Oh. Rex. He did? Yeah, he didn't like the title. Wait, what did he want? I can't remember the story oh, correctly, dear. so I'm gonna. Fan Faroon. They wanted Fan Faroon like Rigadoon. <gasps> really? That's yeah. It. Fan oh, for room. It's terrible, right? Yeah. <laughs> and My Fair Lady, I didn't realize until quite recently, was a play on Mayfair Lady. Wow. Oh. Right? Uh, Layers. My Fair. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because <laughs> so I did watch the movie, but I always fast forwarded through Higgins' songs. <laughs> right. I could not stand <laughs> them. <laughs> Short, but from ordinary man yeah. all the way through, grown accustomed to her face, you break my heart. Yeah. And then I start crying on the stage. Woo! He's marvelous. When we came to see the show, when Mark was talking to me about this, my husband and I came, and um, Harry finished singing, and he was like, I think that's the most talented guy I've ever seen. <laughs> well, you and I had spoken, what is it about the Higgins? Um, talk, sing, speak, sing, because you, I do think, sing it more than other Higgins, right. but still, it the role seems to want. Yeah, I, 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 I think most Higgins, and I've spoken to previous Alex Jennings, who claims to have sung it more than anyone, and I think anyone who everyone gets- Everyone will claim everyone to have sung it more than the next. Most. But I, for the audition and for the first few weeks of rehearsal, I was singing every line, and Eventually, our, our timid MD said, I think you need to start talking some of it. Um, because it was written for Rex, who did this style very well, uh, and because of the ra there, there isn't much of a range to the songs, it adds color. Um, and actually, in a lot of the time, it makes more sense of the lyrics. Um, so I found a way of doing it, and it, that alters Occasionally, but I'm, um, it adds dynamism to it. Mm -hmm. And what what I wanted was to create a a character who, when he's singing the songs, he's not just singing a song. He's he's there's a reason he's singing it. Um, so with Ordinary Man, for example, after we did it a few times, and everyone was like, as you said, can we fast forward this song? Um, <laughs> I, I thought, well, what if? What if this is happening because of a previous relationship? And that opened up a whole <laughs> world of like, you know, the history of a woman with a Gardnerian mother. <laughs> um, and it just fueled it and got us through it quicker. Well, and, and it kind of carries through to- Got us through to one of her songs well, to, Also, but to why can't a woman, you know, be more like a man? Now, now you take the history of what's yeah. been going on between the two of you. Sure. Yeah into that. Um, and, and because he's a science, science guy and he's obsessed with it, 
and uh, in theorizing, he genuinely wants to know the answer. He's not, he's not being, um, he's, he's not being hypothetical or witty. He thinks there's a point, there's a good scientific point to this. That there's a desperation yeah. there too in, and, in trying and to find that's the answer. What, that's what Bach helped me with. Having never sung songs professionally before, he was like, you've got to keep it active. So right to the end of I've grown accustomed, if, if, I, if I make it sentimental, it becomes sentimental. Whereas if, it, it, if, the, if the fight continues <laughs> to try and comprehend his own feelings and her feelings and what all of this um, bubbling whirlpool that has come up inside of what it is, uh, if I can keep it active, then that's, I think, more effective than going, isn't this a lovely song? Because he, that was another thing Bach gave me, was, was an idea for the character that maybe he's someone who, if he was around today, we would say uh, could be classed as having autistic spectrum disorder, i.e. he doesn't understand other people's emotions or his own emotions, and he's very focused on one thing, and that's his fight, and that's his journey to, yeah. to self-discovery and understanding who he is. That's a long sentence. <laughs> We're here for long sentences. There, there's, there's a very, uh, the interesting scene, uh, for, well, they're all wonderful, but I mean, the, the, the most difficult scene for me, for Pickering, was, is when he sings, you did it. Oh, yeah. And because actually, he's always championed Eliza up until that moment, and that's the moment that he joins Higgins in ignoring her. I was gonna ask you about that, actually. I always found it so, so was difficult. I. And the only, and the only reason, the only answer that we sort of came up with is because basically Higgins and Pickering, particularly because of their so much of their time and of their class, even the one thing that, they share is A, this love of language, and they're big sort of overgrown schoolboys. <laughs> and so they made this bet, and even though actually Pickering has lost the bet because he says, I bet you can't do it, he's thrilled when she <laughs> turns into this wonderful, you know, beautiful creature. Well, because it's the unexpected for him. Yes, totally unexpected. And yet, he completely, they get so carried away. The only way I can make sense of that song is that they get so, he gets so carried away with Higgins in the joy of the bet that actually for a second, even Pickering ignores Eliza, and that costs him because he's the one that then makes the phone call to his friend at the home office to see if they can find him. So, it, but it's a very difficult moment because you just think, but well, this doesn't really square with anything that this character has said or done up until this point. But it's, and that's his only song. But it's critical that that happens yeah, for, for totally. both of us. Right. The, 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 yeah. Her mistreatment yeah. is... Um, is unconscious. It's totally part. unconscious. So he's not, you know, he, neither of them are trying to punish her. They're just so swept away by their own kind of schoolboy like joy at having achieved this. But I think that's so clear. You know, I don't, I, there's, I've never had anyone come to the show and say those guys are so horrible. It's very clear that it's unconscious. Yeah. Well, it's also interesting that you brought up earlier that Eliza says she learned. Um, how ladies and gentlemen treat each other from Pickering. I mean, part of that is for his benefit. Yeah. Right, of course. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so there's definitely a bit of her sticking it to him. But it is really interesting in this production that I think the message comes so much farther forward of, well, is that true? The ambivalence of that because of his argument that I just treat everyone the same, yeah. even if it's nasty and even if you don't like it. Right. I'm actually the one who's the most honest. Right, right. Danny, I want to talk to you about two brilliant numbers, a little bit of luck, and get me to the church on time. Since we're talking about the songs of the show, I mean, let's talk about Chris Catelli's choreography in Get Me to the Church and, and tackling that. Do you, replacing and, and coming into something that's just established, right? You're not creating the movement. Do you still have flexibility to bring what Danny would do as Doolittle into it? Into it? Yes, I, I did actually, and that was a, that was a great part of uh, joining the company. They said, you don't if you don't feel comfortable with anything in the choreography, you know, for example, Norbert would do a half split. <laughs> <laughs> Burstein's not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> These old knees, you know, 
No. Um, yes, 35 years of jumping around on stage um, as an actor uh, professionally. And, you know, at a certain point, you literally go, Body just says, eight times a week? Nah, I mean, I can do it, but not eight times once. a week, you know? <laughs> you know once. Yeah. Will you be exactly. at that point? Stop that you know, the last show. <laughs> yeah! Um, but uh, they did give me great flexibility, and it is um, maybe the hardest number I've ever done. And the first time I did it was the put-in. There were still, I still didn't have all the costumes and all that. And, but the, so the first time I did it with the orchestra, with the lights, with everybody on stage, and the right costumes and shoes, what? was the first performance. Yeah. Oh. And there's, you know, there are 30 people swarming around you, and you're, you're, I did a lot of praying, you know, <laughs> that I wouldn't fall off the stage because I didn't know that you really can't see where the edge of the yes. stage is yes. 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 for the first time. Yeah. yeah, and I learned that, you know, on my first performance. Like, oh, I want to walk there, but I don't know if there is a there there. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's the thing about Broadway and, and, and theater in general, as it keeps going, we, that's just, that's expected and asked of all of you performers that, you just go in and you figure it out, and right. and I think that that's one of the most incredible things about our art form is that you guys all rise to the challenge because it's that's just how it goes. Because there are watching, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we all the whole theater. Whilst he was doing this show, this song for the first time. Everyone backstage was glued to a monitor, was willing you on. It was a day. <laughs> wondering whether I would fall off. <laughs> and, and also, Placing bet. <laughs> a big, a big, I also want to uh, give a big shout out to Chris Catelli, as you said, the beginning, who is just an angel, a brilliant, genius guy. I love him. Yeah. Can I be, um, so when, that number, when it, when it was rehearsed, we didn't see it. I think we were in the rehearsal room doing Ordinary Man for four days or something, going just going crazy. And the rest of the world, all our ensemble were, were in a different room rehearsing that. And eventually, on a lunch break or something, he said, can we just show you what we'd be working on? And we said, yeah, sure. And, um, and they did it, and Lauren, Ambrose, and I looked at each other and went, oh my god, this is a musical. And it was <laughs> incredible. And then Bart said, okay, less of the acrobatics, but it's good. <laughs> you say that it's the most challenging number you've done. What, aside from the choreography, or is it the choreography that makes it such a, such a feat? Um, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's everything. It's everything. It's singing it. It's telling the story. Um, it is uh, having enough breath to mm -hmm. sing, to get through it, and then the dancing that goes on after that. And then it just continues on. I feel like this is the, it's the number where we get a little bit of your Adolfo comedian really? coming out. Like oh, that is, yeah. It's yeah. that over the top. Yeah, well, you know, he's drunk in every scene. <laughs> he's drunk. So you know, I did a lot of work to prepare. <laughs> where you just quite literally, I mean, you just plop and fall right back down, almost, I feel like you're gonna somersault over yourself. Um, talk to me about a little bit of luck and the two gentlemen who share the stage with you who are so wonderful to make that lovely, like, sim simple trio that's in such contrast to yeah, Get Me To The Church. Yeah, Joe and Lance, they're amazing actors and uh, they're also people that, you know, you walk into, you walk on stage, and they've been doing it so long that they're so established and they know exactly what they're doing that you feel like, oh gosh, I've got to rise to that level. I've got to have that, that authenticity that they bring just naturally because they've been doing it so long. Uh, I have to have that as well when I walk on stage and they, they have helped me tremendously. And then going into the number, it is truly anything goes every single night so far. They, I do something and then they start aping me and, and then we just have a, a blast. We are really having the most wonderful time. I also want to mention 
Laura and I have a couple of moments that I, I never knew were in there yeah. until we started playing them Same. that are so beautiful. Yeah. I like what? Like no what? idea they were there. And I'd also like to say one more thing. <laughs> Sitting on this panel has been fascinating to me because I'm learning so much. Tell me more about rehearsal. What's rehearsal? Yeah. Can you give an example of one of those moments that you didn't realize was You know what? I, I'll be honest with you. I don't want to yeah. because okay. I don't want to spoil it. Agreed. Because it's yeah. so, it's, things are Tender. happening. And, they're, and they will change every <laughs> single night because that's, that's the best part of doing live theater. Yes. You bring who you are and what you are to that stage that, at any particular time, and, and it's a, a beautiful transition and evolution that happens. And, and that's what, if I may, that's what was wonderful for Alan, I'm talking on your behalf as well. Um, when new people join, you, you talk about raising, having to raise the bar. Alan and I, it feels like we have to raise the bar to meet you, and it's, combination of that and it's and hearing it from a different voice you we really feel like we're hearing it for the first time it's great it keeps After you fresh months. you have to concentrate yeah. which means that you have to plug Listen. right back into the original intention Just and, it's, and that's thrilling actually yeah. it's really thrilling. It, it means you're all really listening so it's it's really alive at the moment I want to talk about the dialects in this show. Oh, <laughs> right? It's They're insane. still using theirs. If I come out of it, I just, it's bad. No, 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 I had to, I had to work for a long time to really get an English <laughs> Really, it, you know, it took me out of my native habitat. <laughs> um, Laura, you're doing something different that I, ha I hadn't really seen in other versions where, you know, she's so full Cockney in that opening scene and, and in the beginning, but then at the ask it, mm -hmm. that it's a little shakier yeah. purposefully that yeah. like, no, she's not perfect She's not there yet. yet. Yeah. She's not there yet. They, they brought her too soon. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, and... and I have, I have a gag with my mother. Don't you think she's ready for it? Like straight up. Yeah, and she's like, no, she's ready for a what's it a bar? A canal bar. A canal, canal bar. She you know, so. But then I do. Then I do say, <laughs> I threw every word in there, and she comes out perfectly. Right, right. So that's a, yeah, it's mixed messages. Sure. Um, but you know, I, in the brief time that I had with Bert, that's something he and I talked about. Um, I had wanted actually, and you know, I could have danced all night to maintain some of the cockney. Just because the idea, the musical theater magic of it, that all of a sudden now she has a, a, a spot on English accent, felt a little false to me, and it always has since I was a child. I tried it for the first few performances, and it just wasn't clear enough because I'm singing, right? You know, and there are just certain vowels that it it it, it wasn't clear. I was working too hard at something that the audience was like, no. <laughs> um, so. Um, I try to bring a bit of what I was trying to do there in into Ask It, where, where she's, you know, she is tr absolutely trying her best, and she's just not there yet. Because, you know, the thing Bart and I had talked about is if she's there in Ask It, then what happens at the ball? There's nowhere to go. She's already spot on. So um, that, for me, is like one of my favorite scenes. I, and I feel like the in-between accent might be the hardest of it all because because it is straddling a line. Like where, what is it in your brain that you're bringing from the Cockney and bringing from? Well, for me, the, you know, the thing that Liz Smith, the dialect coach and I had spoken about is that, you know, just as for me still with the Cockney, I am still tr trying to navigate every word. Mm -hmm. And she is trying to navigate every word of a posh English accent from her Cockney. So it's really about every single word is spoken. You know, it's, it's less of, I'm speaking a full sentence and it's tripping off my tongue. It's the rhythm more, of it. Exactly, it's more rhythm than anything where it's like, I am getting this word that I am saying. Um, and it's really, you know, it's really challenging because the story that I have to tell is so long and there's so much comedy in, the, in between the lines that how do I, get to the end of the phrase so that the entire story makes sense while satisfying the audience in terms of them wanting to laugh, which at that moment in the play, they, they really do. Um, so, yeah. 
And we've earned it because yes. we've gone at a pace for like an hour. And that's the key is you go rattle through the first hour. Yeah. Then they you get, get this amazing more. scene where yeah. you can just take your time. Yeah. And you can feel the relief almost. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, ha, <laughs> You're like really ready. You're like, I didn't do anything. Which begins even a bit earlier in the rain in Spain, I think. That's, that's the first time that the audience really kind of go, Absolutely. ah. Yes. Danny, nice I hear you're, you're a, a student of dialect as well, and that you sort of, you brought that history to being able to find Alfred's copy, that you felt like you were prepared for that. Um, well, when I, in 1989, I was lucky enough to get a scholarship to study at the Moscow Art Theater. We were the first group of American students to go study in Moscow. Um, and on our way there, I, I stayed in London for a little while, and I walked around with my uh, tape recorder, and I asked people to just tell me where they were from and tell me a little bit about themselves. And believe it or not, people were happy to oblige. And uh, one guy, a uh, Cockney man named George, uh, he says, hello, my name is George, and I'm from the Bangladesh region in London. You know, and I thought, fantastic. And I've been waiting all these years <laughs> to, uh, to do that. And in the first scene, uh, there's, in the first scene, I do ask, I talk to a fellow named George. And I, so I said, the reason I say it, I say, when I do it, I say, George, my dad, yeah. is because of that guy. Oh, I, I love that. 1980. I wish we could find George and let him know. <laughs> he was great. He worked in the airport. He was a lovely guy. <laughs> situation or what Higgins is saying about her is funny and you've played so many roles in the past where I mean I just I will always live for your women on the verge Thank that you. Woo! Woo! You know, working as a scholarly maid, working as a whatever, you know, standing up in a boarding house, not even sleeping, wearing all of her clothes. How does one get through that without a sense of humor? And become the person she ultimately becomes. So for me, it's not that I'm trying to make jokes so that the audience laughs. For me, it is truly a part of her character and who she is. That she can see the world through the lens of a sense of humor. And with that comes familiarity with the people the maids who work in Higgins' house, um, the way that, that she and Pickering are with each other, which is, I think, a very warm and loving relationship. And ultimately, for me, what she wants from Higgins. You know, yes, she wants to better herself, for sure. But for me, my version of her is a person who ultimately, she says it in her first song, she, you know, I think she's a simple person who happens to be kind of a genius and is able to pick up this language relatively quickly and really pull something really magical off with the help of these two brilliant gentlemen. But I do think she also wants love, you know? And so that is the place that I come from, that she is wanting love, not necessarily romantic love, but to be seen. To be seen, to be valued, to be treated with kindness, to be treated with respect, which is really universal. It's what we all want, right? And so for me, the way that I approach that is through her sense of humor. And Bart, actually, it's interesting because I'm not sure when you saw the show, but initially when I began, I wasn't playing her as, as tough 
And when Bart came to see the show, he was like, you need to be way more wild. He's like, I don't want you to be kind of scary. You know, you have to Because what he reminded, he reminds us all is that she goes to, they don't make the deal in Covent Garden. No. She no. goes to his house and says, yes, it is her agency. Right. Yeah. You, you said you could do this. I want to do this. Yes. Um, you bring up, though, that she wants love, and we don't, um, we don't have our Freddie Einsford Hill on stage today, but I think that that's what that character really introduces to the story and what, when Jordan Donica originated the role and now Christian Dante White is, yes. is playing this, really brings such a beautiful gentility to it, yeah. as opposed to so often we think we can think of Freddie as, as naive or frivolous, and mm -hmm. instead it's it's a purity. Yeah, I mean, when I get to say to him, you don't think I'm a heartless gutter snipe, do you? You know, like, when, when a person that you really care for has said something really horrible to you, and then you walk out the door and there's this just vessel this sort of like blank slate or this mirror that all he's doing is like reflecting what you want to see in yourself. It's a relief, you know? I'm wondering, I, I wanna talk about that scene at Mrs. Higgins' house between the two of you. So this is what I love. He's like the conservatory, and I'm like, yeah, your mom's house. <laughs> <laughs> he calls it the conservatory, and I call it his mom's house. <laughs> that scene, so, I saw the show on Thursday night again. Um, I had seen the original cast, and now I came back to see uh, all these incredible people, which if you have seen it and you haven't seen them, you have to come back. And if you haven't seen it yet, well, then you're in luck. <laughs> <laughs> and, and watching that scene ratchet up between the two of you, I, I mean, because you didn't really have so many rehearsals, has that just been something you've been finding together on stage? And, and what's, what's the energy and... Well, yeah, we spoke about this yesterday. It's 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 at the end of a very long show. I know I have half an hour. I have a little break while Danny's doing his thing, and then I <laughs> I've then got to follow that personally with exactly half an hour of screaming, <laughs> which is really hard, but it has to go like the clappers. We have to be there. We have to really care about the stakes and that's tough and that's that's where the damage is done to one's voice and that journey is, uh, is is part of our learning process as well but uh it's tough and and these are two people that that kind of miss each other a bit and miscommunicating and and um higgins desperately wants to understand what's going on and want to communicate with her, but everything he says comes out wrong and... Right, because it's, sorry, this is the point in the show when she has, she's now learned how to speak and she succeeds and they've taken all the credit and she says bye-bye. And then he is left to, to, with a hole, both in his home and sort of in his life that's been for the past few months. So he's desperately trying to Figure and then, and then that has to lead to the the grown accustomed, my final number, which has to take the energy of that scene into that song. Laura, what is it for you coming up against, you know, continuing to make your case and coming up against the force and I mean fighting with someone on stage? Yeah. Um it's I think the most challenging part of the play. You know, for me. You know, she, I have done this pretty marvelous thing and have taken on this tremendous task, and, and these two are just mansplaining about how wonderful <laughs> they are. And, um, you know, I, I think, honestly, all women have been there at some point, right? Where you feel like, I'm also in here. Um, and so, you know, He's choking, he's dying. <laughs> so, you know, to, we have that altercation, you know, once everyone goes to sleep, where I, you know, I realize, like, or I feel, I should say, I realize, I feel as if I'm just going to be, it's done. Like, I've done the thing, I've won your bet, and now I'm just gonna be thrust back 
into the world, but with absolutely no skills. So I'm actually now too much of a, I'm too posh to sell flowers in a flower shop, which is what I wanted. Um, the only thing left for me is to marry, which is its own form of prostitution, really. You know, and it, 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 I don't want to give you know any, 19, anything away. In, in, in early 1900s. <laughs> well, yeah, 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 but also now. Um, uh, uh, I'm kidding. I, sort of. Um, but, you know, it, it, he says, like, you could marry some nice guy, essentially, is, is one of the options that's given to me. And um, she, she challenges him. Yes. With complete sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for the first time makes him question his own beliefs and his upbringing. Right, and, and that's why the, this... He's been taught, and that's, that's where the heat comes from, is I don't know what this is. And so for me, when that scene ends with him slamming a door and me being alone with a ring that he has thrown into a couch, you know, I then have the option of, okay, I'm going to try to go back to where I'm from. No one recognizes me. Then it gets so dire that I go to my dad, who's never helped me in my whole life. And even he is like, eh, you're fine. So then what's left to me? Freddie, no thank you. Um, so then I actually end up going to his mother's home, who we don't, the audience doesn't get the benefit of seeing the relationship that we have developed, but you know, um, she speaks of it, that she's grown very fond of, of Eliza. And you know, so I have nowhere else to go. That is where I am. And then he comes in in his floppy coat, and you know, and then we, and we try, and I think it's two people who are genuinely trying to understand each other who are just simply not able to properly communicate. And that's why the new staging of the end of the show is really so brilliant. Yes. I won't give anything away. Um, <sighs> as we are about to close out, I just would love for each of you to share super quickly um, a, a, a satisfying moment for you whether it was on stage, backstage watching someone at a stage door of the My Fair Lady experience, something that once it's done, which it's not, but once it's done, you will take with you. Um, there are too many really, but the, the, one, of, one of the main ones for me, or perhaps the main one, was the Zitz probe, mm. uh, which is the first time we're in the room, in the rehearsal room with the orchestra. And after six weeks, or five weeks, or four and a half weeks, actually, it wasn't very really, uh, uh, suddenly we're there with the orchestra, and everybody was, like, crying. And it's, it's, it's decimating. It's so beautiful and so moving and so powerful. And you suddenly realize that you're about to go out of the rehearsal room onto the main stage with this 28-piece orchestra. And I don't know, that, for me, was probably one of the big moments that I've always well, my favorite moment of the evening is honestly being backstage and watching Laura do I Could Have Danced All Night and Danny do um, Get Me To The Church on the monitor. And just like with a stupid grin on my face <laughs> going, I wish I could do that <laughs> instead of talk sing. <laughs> you sing. <laughs> uh, so fun. Your, your time with my, it has been short. It has but. been short, but my favorite moment so far was after uh, my first performance and coming off stage after Get Me to the Church and the love of the ensemble, uh, patting me on the back and cheering me on. That meant a lot to me. And Laura? Um, this makes me sound gross, but it's the truth. Um, you know, when I, in the beginning, when, when the, that like incredible entrance, the most incredible entrance a human will ever be given. Um, knowing that my parents were in the audience Aww. and that my husband was in the audience, um, that this is the part that I've wanted to play my whole life. It's my you know 13th Broadway show. I've been doing this since I was 18 years old. And I, and I never ever really thought I would get to play this part. Um, to turn around and, and to have, to know that my mother was clapping for me, the person who taught me to sing, the person who taught me to love um, this show, it was really, uh, really meaningful to me. When I was waiting at the end of I Gonna Dance Night, she I can't stop crying! <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much for being here before your matinee.